nothing but the blood. Father in heaven, I want to thank you that we could be here this morning. Thank you for the sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And thank you for the power of the blood of Christ. So touch us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We've been going through a series, started a series a few weeks ago called Faith Builders. Part one was about Noah. And Noah taught us that God can use one person to bless his whole family and to bless all those animals and to start all over again. A brand new creation, recreation of the earth. That's pretty powerful. That's a powerful lesson to learn. Now, I realize that the scope of how God used Noah to make a difference probably won't be repeated. In fact, the Bible says it's not going to be repeated, right? Can I hear amen? amen? So we learned the lesson that God can use one person to make a big difference. That could be you. Right? Count on it. Are you wondering if God is willing? I'm, I'm getting the, the, the vibe that uh, you're wondering if God is willing to, to use you. He sure is. He sure is. Absolutely. Even in spite of you, he's willing to use you. Okay, so that was part one. Part two was last week. In part two, we talked about Queen Esther. That God has a purpose, a plan, and a place. And Esther, God worked up behind the, the scenes for Esther to be in the right place, the right time, for the right purpose. And it impacted the whole nation of her people. Uh, it wasn't too good for Haman. It didn't turn out very well for him, but the guy, you know, the very gallows that he built for Mordecai, he swung on him. So, God has a purpose, a plan, and a place. Could that be for you as well? See, we're trying, faith builders, we're trying to you know, we have this cloud, so great a cloud of witnesses who've run before us, who God used and touched. And is not God still using people today? Amen. Absolutely. I like that. Absolutely. I'm just not so sure that we're really tapping into and the Spirit's power to use us for His purposes and His plan. Um, today we want to take a look at Joseph. Part 3, faith builders, keep dreaming. I think Joseph would basically say to us, keep dreaming. Because Joseph, you know, we, we, see the end, we can see the beginning of Joseph's life. And we can see the end. We got the whole picture. Now, that's kind of an interesting dynamic. You've, you've heard people say, I wish I knew what the future holds. Well, Joseph would say, I'm not sure what the future holds necessarily, but I do know who holds the future. Amen. And see, Joseph kind of lived in that dynamic all of his life through, through everything. Uh, before we get to our scripture reading, um, I want to ask you, what dream do you have? What do you aspire to? Now, we, we definitely want to make it to heaven. And we definitely want to see Jesus. Right? But what about our usefulness on planet Earth? 
What do you aspire to? What desire has God placed in your heart? Uh, it's a serious question. And a lot of us are wondering, first, did God put it there? Second, is God willing to make it happen? We probably are not questioning if God's able to. Am I right? We're pretty much settled on God's able. But what we're not settled on, I would venture to guess, is that is God willing to bring the desire to pass? How many of you say, okay, let's, confession time. Raise your hand. How many say, yeah, God is willing to give you the desire that he put in your heart? Okay, let's count. No, just kidding. <laughs> Over here, let me see, hands. Okay, good. This sermon is going to land really well with you then. Right? I have a dream. Remember Martin Luther King said that? I have a dream. Well, I have a dream too. My dream is not for the nation, although I suspect I do have a dream for the nation as an American. But my dream is for the Naples Seventh-day Adventist Church. I have a dream. I have this idea of what the future looks like, what God's preferred future looks like for our church. And that future is that the Naples church would, would fulfill its missional mandate to connect people to Jesus Christ. I mean, that is a powerful dynamic in and of itself. And the desire, getting back to the desires of your heart, if it, if that is not included somehow directly or indirectly in your desire, I want to say to you, you got to bring it back to God. Because God wants to use you for his kingdom. He doesn't want to just make sure you become the best singer, the best performer, the best accountant. He doesn't want to only be in your labor. He wants to be in your life. And it's got to be something to do with how it impacts people for his kingdom. We've got to see people with kingdom eyes like he does. The Naples Seventh Avenue Church to fulfill its missional mandate to connect people to Christ. I mean to really love people and accept them right where they are and lead them to the source of life, Jesus, as best we can. As frail and as faulty as we are. And then transform them. You can't transform. I can't transform anybody. But the Holy Spirit can. And how are we cooperating with the Holy Spirit for the transformation of people's lives for God's glory and his honor? Let me tell you something. If the desire that you have in your heart and in your life, God put it there, it will accomplish two things. I mean, it'll accomplish a lot of other stuff, but it's got to accomplish two things if it came from God. Are you sure, Pastor, two things? Yeah. Absolutely positive. One, it'll glorify God. Second, what will it do? Edify, build up other people. For the kingdom. Imagine a church like that taking seriously its missional mandate to connect people to Christ, 
transforming them into his likeness. Wow. Creating environments where the spirit is working through leaders, indwelling leadership, leading them and guiding them to create environments in a community of faith where people's lives are being transformed. In fact, you should be changed just a little bit from being here today. Because if you're not being transformed and changed at all, we're not doing something right. Or, or, you're not. Whose responsibility is it, ultimately? It's yours. I mean, we have a responsibility to try to put on, I mean, to do a faithful, honest worship time. Amen? Equipping them. Wow. Training them, empowering them. Giving them the tools and the ability, at least trying to, to serve a living God and a soon coming king. Can you imagine a church that was motivated and operational and actively involved in its neighborhood and community? Can you imagine a church like that? That gets me pretty excited. I have a dream. Could God do it? Is he willing? Is he able? You know, I think Joseph is a powerful example. Moms, happy mom's day. My mom's passed away. Uh, My wife's mom's passed away. So if you still have your mom, give your mom a hug. Say, I love you. You know? But Joseph, you know, Joseph had his mom. Remember her, his na- her name? Rachel. You know what? Rachel didn't have a lot of time with Joseph. Right? Benjamin, after Benjamin was born, it was pretty much it, right? So, all, all I can say is that whatever she did was pretty powerful in the life of Joseph to connect him to a living God. Because I want you to turn in your scripture. Before, before we go to the scripture reading, turn to Genesis chapter 42. I hope I got the right text in my mind. Actually, it's 39. Verse 21. Genesis 39, verse 21. You see, Joseph was sent to prison for not accepting the advancements of Potiphar's wife. Huh? What? I thought you'd be sent to prison if you accepted the advances of Potiphar's wife. Imagine you did what was right and you still ended up in the slammer. What's wrong with this picture? Because now listen, don't we pretty much think that hey, if I do my job well, maybe I'll get promoted. If I treat people nicely, they should treat me nicely. I mean, the idea is usually what goes around comes around kind of a thing. Although we don't believe in karma. And karma is not a Christian dynamic. What's up? So he gets thrown in jail. Of course, Potiphar could have killed him. Probably would have, but he... That would give you an understanding that maybe, maybe Potiphar liked Joseph. I'm going to get to the text I want to read. Just don't, but just, you got to get this though. You got to get this because Joseph was thrown in jail because 
Potiphar's wife lied to him saying he made advancements at me. He, she bore false witness. Joseph was really stellar. His integrity was rock solid. 20 something year old man. And the Bible says he was handsome. And I bet you Potiphar's wife was uh, probably not too bad looking either. Unlike in our culture today, Joseph, but look, look at, oh, just an amazing thing to me. Verse 21. Oh, let's read verse 20. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into, pris into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. But, ha, ha, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority. Because the Lord was with him. There's that, again, the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. You see, Joseph's life was anointed by the Holy Ghost. Not just here, but especially here. Why? Because he said, how? How? Potiphar has, look at what he's done. He's given me all these things. Look at how much trust he's put in me. How could I relinquish? How could I do anything to ruin that trust he's put in me? And how could I sin against a great God? And yet he goes to jail. Unjustly, unfairly. You know what? That is, the, that is Joseph's whole life. Joseph, it didn't really matter. Joseph, his whole life was, whatever happens, happens. God's in it, and I'm going to remain true. And we lack that today. Let's go to our... Scripture reading. Chapter 37, verses 19, 20. Oh, you're, you're saying, tell me, Pastor. What are you asking me for? Verse 18. We'll start at verse 18. Genesis chapter 37, verse 18. Now, we've kind of, we got to kind of go to the beginning now. We're not going to go through Joseph's whole life. There's not enough time. Now, when they saw him afar off, that's his brother's, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I grew up in a family of, of five, excuse me, four brothers and a sister. And I'm the youngest, so I got beat up a lot. <laughs> Literally. And my dad bought me a bike to go to Little League practice, and they used to steal it on me, and I couldn't get to practice all the time. And I had my beefs with my brothers and with my sister, but they never conspired to kill me. <laughs> but they did for Joseph. No. Not spank him. Not get a willow tree switch 
which my dad did that a few times. And we did have a willow tree in our front yard. Man, could you believe that? Seriously, we did. Or my mom used to say, wait till your father gets home. Joseph was worried about his brothers. Maybe not. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit, and we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will come of the, his dreams. And, of course, Reuben steps in, the oldest, the eldest steps in. First of all, look at the deceit in the family. Look at the hatred in the family. The disdain. You know, you have to hate somebody a lot to want to kill them. How can you really love someone, really care for them, really just really have high affection even, you know, and then want to punch you in the face? They, they don't go together. You just, but see, if I have hate towards you, and I, man, I really don't like you, I could punch you. It's easy for me to, right? So imagine, you got to crank that up a few notches to kill them. How are they going to kill them? Shoot them with a gun? At a distance, how would they kill him? They probably wouldn't stone him. That would take too long. Cut, kill, stab him. Choke him. It would be personal hands-on. Your own brothers. You know, but what, what really kind of gets me is that Joseph... I'm sure he must have been confused. And, and, and no, he's, here he is, a young man. This, is, this happened when he was 17 years old, Bible says. 17 years old. And he told, which might have been a stupid thing, he told his family about the dreams God gave him. And they all said, you, are you saying God's going to, you know, you, we're going to bow down to you? I, I, I'm not sure, maybe Joseph knew that they would. But he certainly didn't know the context or what was going to happen. He, did, he couldn't see that, could he? No, he hadn't, he hadn't the foggiest, foggiest idea. But somehow, he didn't really know necessarily what was going on. But, but even here, he had this dream, and somehow God was going to fulfill this dynamic in his life one way or another. And I can't help but think that when Joseph was on this caravan, this camel... And he's a slave now. He's been sold. Does anyone know how many pieces of silver he was sold for? 20. 20 pieces of silver. And that wasn't for a really good slave. That was a pretty bad slave. I can't help but imagine what Joseph was thinking on that camel ride to Egypt. A Jew going to a foreign country, just a young man, wondering how he could see God's hand in his life at this time. But here's what Joseph would say, even while he was going through this. I'm not saying that he didn't have his doubts at times, but I think Joseph would say this to you and to me. You may not be able to trace God's hand in your life right now. You may not be able to trace his hand in your life right now, but you can trace his heart. I have uh, plans for you. I have a future for you. I have a hope for you. God is too good. Too good not to always do what's in your best interest. And if that is true, you can always trace his heart. You can say, God, I don't understand this. I don't get this at all. And you know what, God? I'm a bit ticked off at you. Is that sacrilegious? Because if you are, 
and you're trying to kid him, you're silly. See, I, I would say Joseph during his life. Okay, let's let's just let's just briefly go through this real quickly here. He has the dreams, two visions, two dreams. God gave him, right? One was the sheaves bound down to his sheaf, and then the stars and the moon and the sun. Bowing down to him? I don't know. Well, cool. Okay, then he gets thrown in the pit, sold into slavery, and he becomes a servant at Potiphar's house, which is kind of cool. All right, now Potiphar is like the head military guard of all the, all the army of, e of Egypt. He had a lot of power. So do you think that was by accident? Probably not. Then he has the encounter with his wife, Potiphar's wife, and he gets thrown into jail. Thanks, God. Did the right thing, and look where I end up. But he notices that God is giving him favor, working through his life and his labor. And Joseph's got the Midas touch. You know what I mean by that, right? Everything, God, everything Joseph does... God blesses, and it produces, it turns out really well for him. The Midas touch. Everything he touches turns to gold. Wouldn't you like that? Who said no? Well, I mean, for, for five minutes, turn to gold. That would be good. Whatever. He threw you under the bus, you know. He threw you under. He threw you. Okay, so he's in jail. Uh, he gets, he, these two guys have a, have a dream. They each have a, their own dream. The cupbearer, of the uh, former cupbearer of Potiphar, and the baker of Potiphar. And they, they, t they tell Joseph his dream. And Joseph said, you know, tells him the interpretation of the dream, what it means. It turns out not really well for the baker. Right? The, 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 the news was bad for the baker, but for the cupbearer, the news was pretty good. He was going to get reinstated into being the cupbearer of the Potiphar again. And Joseph says, listen, and this is two years, well, it's not two years yet, but this is what happens is, he says to the cupbearer, remember me when you get out of here. Help me out. Hmm. Interesting. What happens? Forgets about him. Two years pass. I would be fuming. Imagine sitting, we're not talking about sipping on virgin pina coladas here. In prison I'm talking about. Hello? How are you feeling toward God two years in prison? How was Joseph feeling? Here, here, this, I, I know I'm speculating, but I think Joseph is taking, using this downtime to develop his patience and develop his faith in his relationship with God. Everything he's doing with all the prisoners, God is just blessing it. And people are seeing it. He's not sulking. He's not harboring animosity towards his brothers. How do I know how can you be successful? How can you really have God's blessing on your life and your labor if you're harboring bitterness and resentment? You can't. Plug yourself into that. When you've been done wrong to, are you harboring resentment and bitterness? You hurt yourself more than the other person. Joseph doesn't buy into that. Joseph knows about that. He's just, he, he, we can infer this very easily because the way God is blessing him. It's not hard. 
So let's just... Uh, let's fast forward it. There's a famine in the land. Okay, the Pharaoh has his dreams, the, his couple of dreams, right? Uh, uh, and it comes out, bottom line is, there's going to be a f- seven years of... First, there's going to be seven years of plenty, and then there's going to be seven years of famine. And so Joseph tells him the interpretation of the dream and all this stuff, which is part of that. And so they make a plan. Right? Joseph, and Joseph's behind it, and Joseph carries it out. He's the administrator. And so what happens is, all the people of Egypt, they, they bring in what, the seven years of plenty, they, they bring in the extra stuff, and they, they build these silos, and they store up all this food for years to come. And then this famine comes, sure enough, and what happens? There's famine in all the land. And guess who's hungry? Back home, where Jacob is and the sons. Yeah, all those guys. Jacob says, hey, we're hungry. Go get some food. I hear there's food in Egypt. Where's Joseph in Egypt? Did they know that? Okay, so they go down, and what happens? The Bible says they get kind of brought right into Joseph, right into his company, and what do they do? They bow down. They bow down. And Joseph, the Bible even says this, Joseph says he remembers his dream. And he, and he sees the fulfillment of it. Now there's something very important for you to realize about their dialogue between the brothers and Joseph. Joseph, is, he's not in disguise. They don't, just, they don't recognize him because he's been an Egyptian culture for a long time. Egyptian culture is very different from Hebrew culture. He... Hebrew culture, they're hairy. Egyptians, shaved. No, no laughs at that one. That's one big difference in, in the culture. They didn't know it was Joseph, but Joseph knew who they were. And the Bible says that Joseph spoke to them through an interpreter. So when Joseph spoke to them, he spoke Egyptian. I don't know if they, is that Egyptian or is that Egyptian? Is there a different name for that? Egyptian. And of course, they spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, Hebrew, okay, something like that. Okay, so the, the, the idea is Joseph's able to keep his anonymity. He doesn't, they don't know who he is, and he figures that out. He wants to figure out something. You see, their hearts have, their conscience has been seared hardened over the years. And Joseph wants to find out only one thing in his dealing with them. Have they changed? And so he tests them. And, and, and he, he, has to go, he has to leave because he begins to sense something's happening. Because they say to Joseph, Joseph, God, God is bringing this upon us and you're keeping us here and Benjamin is out there. We're not going to be able to go back and all kinds of bad things are happening. God is bringing judgment on us. And Joseph is seeing that as, ah, oh, you do have a conscience. Ah, oh, maybe something is happening. But he wants to see his brother. He wants to make sure his dad is still alive or at least find out what's happening with him. So he does what he does with all the food and baskets and gold and all that. You see, Joseph in his whole life, his whole deal, he would come up with these two ideas. Give up or go on. Because he's misunderstood by his family. Pretty much. I mean, he didn't understand the dream, what, what it all meant necessarily. Some say he was cocky. Uh, uh, maybe. Sold into slavery by his brothers. Well, do you, do you give up or go on? Live in a strange country far from home. Give up or go on. Give fair, given Pharaoh favor in Potiphar's house, give up or go on. Well, of course, you're going to go on with that one, right? 
Wrongly accused by Potiphar's wife. Give up, go on. You see, these are very same things that we ask ourselves in our journey with our great God. Because we sometimes don't like what God does to us. Or what he allows. Am I right? And we say, give up or go on. Now, now you might not give up totally. Probably won't give up totally. And tell everybody, I'm throwing in this Christian towel. You won't do that. You'll be sneakier about it. I'll still put on the front. Am I right? Thrown in the prison, give up or go on. Put in charge of all the prisoners, give up, go on. Probably go on. Forgotten by the chief butler, uh uh-oh, give up or go on. Remain in prison two years. Interpret Pharaoh's dream. Became second in command of Egypt. Of course, there's some give-ups there and there's some go-ons, right? If you countered them, there would be seven give-ups and four go-ons. Brothers and sisters, you are faced with that all the time. What is the general tendency of your heart when you ask yourself these questions? You can say prophecy being fulfilled. You can say that. And if it encourages you to want prophecy being fulfilled, hey, that's important, prophecy being fulfilled. So I ask you, I, I, I ask you, like I asked you at the beginning, what is the dream you have? Jesus would, excuse me, Joseph would say, look, I don't know how God did it, but he did it. Because let's turn to our closing scripture. We got to read this. We can't leave this place without reading this. Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. What happens here is Isaac, excuse me, Jacob dies. Jacob dies. And the brothers are all worried again that Joseph is finally going to get his revenge on them. Verse 17, let's read that. Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. At least they're taking responsibility. Can I hear an amen? Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of our Father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. He didn't cry, he wept. For a different reason now. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for for am I in the place of God? But as for you, verse 20, You meant evil against me. But God meant it meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day, this day, to save many people alive. I want to implore you. I want to implore you. God wants to do the same through you. 
the alive, people alive part. But not just alive physically, alive spiritually for his kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, what is going to leave planet Earth when all everything is said and done? Your kids. Your mom, your dad. Your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle. Your cousins. People in the community. Your church. That's it. If that's true, and we know it is, you are not going to convince me otherwise that God wants to use you to save the lives of others. Because that will bring him glory and it will build up people for his kingdom. Building faith is grounded and rooted in that dynamic of God. It's not just about you. It's also about what God wants to do through you for others. I have a dream. The Naples Seventh-day Adventist Church would take the missional mandate that she has seriously. And figure out, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, to implement it and pursue the mission by his grace. Father in heaven, thank you for each one here today. Thank you for the wonderful lessons we have learned from your faithful servant, Joseph. Talk about dealing with adversity. Talk about dealing with injustice in his life. Help us to cling to you like he did. May your vision catch us. May it catch us. Please, God. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.